to Self Care Saturday with Indy Jones. I am happy and pleased and proud to welcome my two guests today. And instead of me introducing them, I asked them to introduce themselves. So we're going to begin with Kamisha. And um, please introduce yourself to the audience. Hey, everyone. Uh, my name is Kamisha Dre Hodge. And I believe that every Black woman has a story to tell and that sh it should be done as professionally, intentionally, and unapologetically as possible. That's why I created Sovereign Wild Publications, where we help Black women create uh, amazing works through the self-publishing process. Um, I have an MA in English and a certificate in book publishing, and I'm an introvert. So <laughs> nice to be here. <laughs> Thank you. I'm going to ask you both a question about introverts, um, about being an introvert in a minute. But um, thank you. Um, so, Sovereign um, Noir, you, can you tell people um, where they can find you, Kamisha? Yeah, sure. So we have a website, www.sovereignnoir.com. Um, you can also find us on Instagram, sovereign.noir. Um, we're on Facebook under the same name, Twitter under Official Sovereign Noir, and you can also find us on Pinterest under Official Sovereign Noir as well. Perfect. Consistency in your branding. That's love what it. I love. <laughs> yes. Thank you. And then Leslie. So I'm Leslie Penelope. Thank you so much uh, for inviting me. I'm a, a fantasy and paranormal romance author. I write fantasy as L. Penelope, and uh, my series Earthsinger Chronicles uh, is complete now. The first book was listed as one of Time Magazine's top 100 fantasy books of all time. And um, thank you. I'm also a podcaster. I have a podcast called My Imaginary Friends. I started out self-published and I'm still hybrid. So I both self-publish and traditionally publish. So my publishing journey has been really um, interesting. And I, and I love Black romance and, and fantasy and, um, you know, Black love and incorporating that into different genres, including paranormal romance and also fantasy romance. So that's one of my missions. <laughs> right. And, and um, where can people find you, Leslie? My website is lpenelope.com, and I'm also on Instagram and Twitter as Leslie Penelope, and L-E-S-L-Y-E, -E. so that, those are the, the main places to find me. Thank you, and congratulations. That's, that's huge. Thank yes. you. So are your books. Thanks. <laughs> you have, I mean, it's wonderful, meaty um, world building, and I liked how you really bring your readers into your world and, and let them know, you know where you are and, and along your process. And I believe that's um, the reason why probably part of the reason why people um, enjoy reading, you look forward to, to your books and, and it, it also just makes you very personable. That's what I always get when I, when I see your postings online. So thank you both for today for, for giving me a little bit of your time. I know you both are very busy ladies. And as a result, let's just jump right into it because I'm gonna value your time. So our first question is, and we're gonna start with Leslie, since Kamisha went first with the introductions. What does it mean to be a black woman in the 21st century? Mm. It is, you know, I've been doing a lot of research on in, in history for a, a new novel that takes place in the 20s. And I'm finding out just how, uh, how not different it is from our ancestors. You know, we've made so many strides in the 21st century and things are in, in a lot of ways so much better than they were, um, but we are dealing with the same issues. So being a black woman in the 21st century is a lot of times about just the struggle to exist as a whole person, which I think our ancestors were also dealing with, you know, um, it's on, on so many different levels, but, you know, emotionally and mentally and physically, um, just every level, it is kind of just struggling to be a whole person and to just exist and, um, and, and be complete. And, and, you know, like resilience is a word that comes up a lot. I think that you're talking about, uh, that's a big part of it too. Um, so yeah, that's, that's my answer. We're, we're echoing the struggles of our ancestors in new ways, mm -hmm. but we're still on that path towards, you know, liberation um, of our bodies and our minds and our spirits, I think. Thank you. Thank you. Can you just I agree. I agree. I think that one of the key points that you made about echoing the same frustrations and oppressive systems 
in a different way completely resonates with what Black women experience as as intersectional beings in the 21st century. Um, I will also add that it's so beautiful to see how much more um, camaraderie I've seen with Black women uh, as I've grown older. Um, I also really love the fact that that we're not a monolith. Mm -hmm. That is something that I have always admired. You know, there's this idea that Black women are just struggling all over the place. Everywhere we're just struggling. We have wealthy Black women. We have entrepreneurs. Black women are out here creating their own businesses and thriving. We're self-publishing. And when we don't find something and these systems are, you know, intentionally pushing us out, they won't invite us to the table. We literally build our own tables. So I, I love that about the 21st century Black woman. Um, but I definitely do agree that even though we are seeing all of this, this growth and uh, expansion of what it means to be a Black woman, we still are under that same oppressive system that our ancestors have, have, have unfortunately had to endure and, and suffer through. So, yeah. It, it is one of the things where you're like, yeah, <laughs> you know, like in the end, because it's kind of like a weighty feel. Yeah, <laughs> it is. It, you know, I don't know, just like a sigh, right? Because you can say all that. And I think that even when you say that you have Black women are in a multitude of places, I think that was true exactly with what Leslie was saying as well. Mm -hmm. Whether 50 years ago, 100 years ago, you're going to find Black women in a lot of different um, places. Yes, a lot more doors are being opened up and we and we have a lot more opportunities to maybe um, have our vision and missions met. Like, so with Leslie, I, and I, I remember um, definitely with you being um, an indie author and, and that, that switch, but even having that choice, you know, having, having, having the opportunity to publish something um, on your own, um, totally under your own terms, right. making all those, all those executive um, decisions, but at the same time, having someone else who also sees the value in your work and that you can do that duly. Mm -hmm. And there is a, there is a power and, and a certain amount of privilege, I think in that as, as well. Um, but it is like, yeah, a repeat sometimes. And, and that my traditional publishing just to interject has been because of black women. I'm at two different publishers with two different black women editors. Oh. And so th having us in positions of, of power where you can choose, you know, be those gatekeepers and bring people along and expose them to the masses is, is really important. And it's, it's slow, but it's, you know, there are more of us there than there were 10 years ago. And hopefully in 10 years, there'll be many, many more. Yeah. Yeah. That, and that's a great point about, where people find themselves and whether it, it allows for an open door or a closed one, whether people have an open mind as far as seeing the need mm -hmm. um, or not seeing the value of mm -hmm. something. So you, you raise a great point. So to go along with that, what words, images, and or people come to mind when you think of the word resilience? <laughs> Black women, you know, like you said, we're always the, I know, I think Leslie said it, we're like the poster child of resilience, right? We, whether it was during slavery, when we had to take care of our own homes and the slave master's homes, right? Whether it was post-slavery during segregation, we still had to take care of our homes and find ways to make it work. Um, and we also have to remember that this was not that long ago. <laughs> this was not that long ago. My grandma um, on my mother's side, my maternal grandmother, she used to work as a house. At, uh, I hate using the word help, but that's what she said her job was. Her job was as the help in white homes. My family's from Lynchburg, Virginia. So you can <laughs> take from that what you will. <laughs> and so having her have that experience and having to take care of her granddaddy and her kids and being the one of the eldest children and having to make sure that she took care of her siblings 
that's resilience. My mom taking care of me, my brother and my sister without the assistance of our fathers, that's resilience. Me being there for my nephew, being there for my siblings, being there for my partner, that's resilience. Us being able to maximize the opportunities that we have while still being in this oppressive state. I want to make sure that I keep, because there is a duality here that I want to make sure that the listeners and the viewers are, are, are keeping in mind. While we do have these great opportunities, we still have this system on our shoulders. There was a reason why Zora Neale Hurston said, Black women are the mule of the world. Right. It's it's literally we have to take care of ourselves and the people that depend on us and the people that don't care about us. That is resilience to me. It sucks. And I hate having to be resilient. It shouldn't it shouldn't be that way. Um, But again, when I think of resilience, I think of black women, black mothers, black sisters, black educators, black social workers. And in most of those in my experience, have been Black women. That's that's what resilience looks like to me. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And, and building off that, like the images that kind of come to mind, if, if thinking about objects, I think about like something elastic or, or a rubber band. Mm-hmm. So we have to stretch. We have to be able to sort of include, you know, rubber bands gather things, they bring things together and they can stretch, but they can also break. Yeah. And so there's that, that double-sidedness where we have to be really um, elastic. We have to be adaptable. We have to be able to exist in so many different spheres. There's like the double consciousness mm-hmm. aspect. You know, we have our community kind of like what Kamisha was saying and be there for our family and our community and also work for their family and their community and, and bear burdens yeah. a lot of times. Um, and so it's a lot of times it's just how, mu- how far can you stretch and expand and increase your capacity without breaking and making sure that you're still going to be, have that elasticity for the future and for everyone else that needs you and for yourself too. Yeah. So and I think, I mean, resilience is important for everyone. It's a, it's a good quality to have. If you're not forced to have it, you know, resilience is also strength. I, I think of just the foundations and, you know, the strength of our, our parents and our grandparents and all, everything that they've had to go through and, and survive through. So that is, those are the things that kind of come to mind for me. Yeah, yeah, you're definitely right. I mean, we all need resilience. And, but I think it is the weightiness of it, the the level of need to be resilient, that that definitely varies depending on on the community, like you said that, or how young you have to even be resilient. That you know you have these little kids at five and six, and they're learning resilience in the way that some adults, you know, mm-hmm. haven't had to. Mm-hmm. And and of course, there that's a serious um, issue. And I, I love your um, analogy, but even before it breaks, think about how how taught it has to be, right? Yeah, all that takes a lot. Place, right <laughs> before that band actually um, breaks. Ah, okay, that's one of my other sighing moments, guys. <laughs> yes, I got me sighing here. Okay, so I'm going to give you an option, and you can choose which one of these questions you would like to respond to. And I think Leslie will begin with this one. So describe a time in your life when you weren't as resilient as you wanted or needed to be, or a time in your life in which you felt truly resilient. Yeah, there have been several times when I I wasn't as resilient as I needed to be. Uh, and I think it's because my, my rubber band snapped, you know, we go through a burnout and that's what it, I usually call it when you've had enough. So I went to graduate school um, in California and I have a graduate degree in multimedia and our second year, our thesis project in that program was a group project, which as an introvert was a nightmare, <laughs> a year long <laughs> group project to get my master's. And I was also working full time. Um, and so dealing with multiple personalities and it was, it was three people and a three group, a three person group can often be two against one, which is what happened. So managing that and trying to be the peacemaker between these two competing 
people who weren't getting along over the course of this project. And also um, I was in the dot-com industry. So I was doing tech support. And at a time, it was in Northern California when the dot-com boom was, ha- I mean, bust was happening actually. And so people, were, we were getting laid off and there was so much pressure and there were so many points of pressure from all different parts of my life that I was going through. And um, at a certain point after that year, I think I just, I snapped a little bit. I had a, I had a burnout. Um, I was still functional. Like I didn't have the luxury to check out completely. I still had to pay bills and and live and everything. But I definitely remember being for months, just emotionally drained, not really being able to give to my relationships or my friends and family. And that's a danger that I learned, you know, early on in my early twenties. And I realized, you know, my plate, I have a big plate. You know, I've heard someone talk about, you can fill your plate with all these things. And those of us who have a big plate have to be really careful because when that plate is full, Mm -hmm. our burnout is severe. And uh, I never wanted to go through that again. Um, I have had minor incidences of burnout after that because not being able to balance everything. But yeah, you're juggling so much. You just, you pile on too much. You take on too much. And you think, well, I've handled it before and I can add it. And it in the moment, sometimes you don't realize how much you're doing until the plate is full, the band snaps, and you are just, you're done. You're emotionally and spiritually empty. Mm-hmm. So that is a time when, um, and I learned a lot from that. You know, I think you're, you're always growing from everything you've been through, but it's just a, a time that to be so low and to feel so at the bottom of everything where you just have nothing to give anyone else is, is a place where we really have to be careful not to get there if, if at all possible. So, Kamisha, before you um, before you answer, I, I would like Leslie if I can ask a follow up question, and again, feel comfortable. I want you to feel comfortable answering it. Um, so, when you when you went through that that point in your life, and clearly you didn't stay there. So, for, for our listeners, um, would you mind outlining maybe one or two maybe conscious decisions or actions that you took to maybe help pull yourself out of that? Yeah, I think it was. Um, Turning to relationships, you know, trying to rely on people for help and also like filling the well. Like I wasn't right. This was before I was really writing, um, looking to, looking at writing professionally. And I've discovered that filling the well with creatively or spiritually, whatever feeds you, you know, it's like burnout is sort of um, like starvation almost. You've starved yourself of everything that you need to nourish yourself. So it was um, spiritually feeding myself through trying to find things that spoke to me and also, um, you know, trying to rely on and friends and family for that support and, um, and, and also kind of that, that nourishment of, of being like, you know, held up by people who, who care about you and who love you. I think those are the two important things that helped me out of that process. Great. And I have a question that relates to that, but I'll hold off on that. I'll, I'll pose it after, um, they have opportunity to, hear Kamisha's story? There's been so many times where I felt that I should have been more resilient um, when I was first laid off from a job that I really enjoyed. I was a poetry teacher with the Bronx Writer Corps. Wow. And I loved it. The kids loved it. But Unfortunately, the funding that they were using to pay me was for a different age group. And so they're like, not your fault, but we had to lay you off. And I was like, oh my God, why? This is the only thing I ever wanted to do in my life. And I can't even, it was just, it was really bad. Um, And then there was another time where I quit a job because I just, the place was toxic. There were a lot of places where in my life, I thought I wasn't as resilient as I should have been. But the reality of it is that I was a little more resilient than I should have been. I didn't allow, I did the opposite of practicing self-care. I didn't think that in the moment my desires were valid. I didn't Mm -hmm. want to feel comfortable enough to feel how I felt, if that makes sense. Um, I felt that in a lot of ways I had to ignore what I was feeling, how I was feeling 
and didn't give myself enough time to grieve before I moved to problem solving mode. And so it, it, it's like a double edged sword because when it comes to resilience, I don't want to be resilient. <laughs> I want to, I don't, I don't want to be more, res- I don't want to be resilient at the expense of my, my self-care. And so I feel like, you know, we're, we're not really typically taught that we're taught, okay, this happened, figure out how to solve it. This happened, move on. We don't get the time to not necessarily wallow in our emotions, but we don't get the time to sit with our emotions before we make those decisions on, should I keep going? Should I pivot? Should I do this? Like, we don't get the the time to think about what direction works best for where we're, where we're at in the moment. And so I think that in experiencing all of those resiliences, um, I think that was the, the resilience for me with the end goal being me being able to say, okay, this thing happened. It's not ideal. How do I feel in the moment? What should I do next? What would be best for me? What do I need right now? Resilience in a way led me to develop my ability to practice self-care in a more um, intentional way, a more specific way, in a way that really allowed me to have conversations with myself that were difficult. And I, I, don't, I didn't get the chance to do that during those other times where I was being resilient. It was more so like, wow, this sucks. Let's do this now. You know, so that's 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 my experience with resilience. And I know that a lot of people will be able to say, I I feel that girl, because we don't really get a break. We don't get a break emotionally to just exist and to to take in the things that are happening. Yeah, I think you raise a lot of critical points. But even like you said, taking the time to have that conversation with self, because sometimes even if you have a really great person who you can be vulnerable um, with you still should have that conversation with yourself Absolutely. oftentimes before you even perhaps engage someone else even if it's just to get clarity like you said about what you feel what you think mm-hmm. and um and I know we talked about when I did the professional development on resilience during the pandemic and one of the pieces was all about emotions and I put that in the book book as well but you know people have to think about what were they taught about emotions, whether either directly or indirectly. And I think you kind of really kind of alluded to that because if we don't have the best understanding of our emotions, how to manage our emotions, then we're not always making perhaps the the best decisions or the healthiest healthiest decisions for ourselves and probably not for other people as well. So sometimes going back to that origin Mm-hmm. And thinking about what did you learn? Do I still hold those beliefs? And if not, what do I believe now? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, that becomes really important. Were you going to say something, Leslie? I'm sorry. I didn't want to. No. Okay. Um, you guys talked about, I think, um, like family and, and, and friends and relationships. And I had a, a question that I'll go to now because I think it, it's just a, a very nice follow up. Um, so begin with you, Kamisha. Um, what does community mean to you? Oh, that's a that's a great question. Um, community, it's it's something that I believe every person should build intentionally. I know I use the word intention a lot, but it's it's very critical. When, when I think of community, I think of the people that I allow in my space. I think of the energies that I allow to be near me. I think of the benefits um, that people bring, their, their intellect, their personalities, their goals, right? Um, when I think about community, I think about making sure that whatever deficits I have, the people around me can make up for that. So let's say for instance, I'm, I lack self-awareness. 
this is not real life, but this is just an example. If I lack self-awareness, I'm, I'm, it's very critical to have a community around me that's honest and forthcoming so that they can, you know, let me know, hey, you know, during the conversation you had with John or Jane, right? Maybe you could have approached it in a different way. You came off really harsh and you know, I think I owe it to you as a friend, as a peer, as a colleague, whatever, to let you know that and hold you accountable. Because I know that this is not the best that you can be. And I want to help you grow and develop. That's what community means to me. It means accountability. It means love. It means making sure that each person is, is not below half their cup. You know, being able to identify, hey, I haven't heard from you in two weeks. And I know that we talk every few days. So what's going on? It, it means caring and, and loving and being open and honest enough to have difficult conversations without taking it personally. That's what community is to me. Community is a very sacred, very very vital thing to the development of us. If we're hanging around the same people that we hung around with like 10 years ago and they're still where they are, chances are that you're not going to see a lot of growth with that person if they're still in the exact same spot. And, you know, you need to determine, well, is this person, am I really benefit from having this person around? What, what am I getting from this relationship? What makes it mutually beneficial? So those are the sorts of things that I think about when it, when it comes to curating a community. But community is definitely something that should benefit every single person within it. Every single person. It's not a one-sided relationship. Yeah, no, I totally agree. And and the, the word that came to me as you first started talking was curated, like mm-hmm. we curate our communities and sometimes they are there for a, a period of time and they're not mm-hmm. supposed to be forever. Yeah. You know, I think about when I first started writing and um, I was taking a lot of classes, I was in workshops and that was the community I had then and they led me forward. Now, a lot of those people are still where they were. And so right now they were for that time. And I've built a new community and curated different people. And, you know, I, I have just multiple communities for different things, you know, because writing is so important to me. I have that and, you know, friends and some friends are for a period of time. And then, you know, you move apart um, and you're not there anymore, but you, you were, they, they were supporting me and loving me. And, you know, I was supporting them and loving them at that time mm-hmm. also. So I think it's an important thing to remember that it, you don't have to be beholden to this idea of community when you've outgrown it yep. because then it's doing more harm than good. Mm-hmm. But you can, you can look back at it with gratitude for what it brought you at that period of time. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, the people that you choose, I think that's an important thing. Um, and the other idea that I had was, I can't remember the name of it, but there's a, a concept like in um, like Egyptian mythology of like a boat with souls and, and the souls that, that you go through life with. Mm-hmm. Um, there's, a, there's a term for that. Uh, and, you know, so some people, your family, um, in many cases, are there with you, you know, your entire life and they come through. Sometimes you have to say goodbye to family and they're not, you know, if it's toxic relationships and things like that. Um, but in, you know, in many cases, you're able to, you're, you're there entire life with, with that, with those people. Um, and then, the, of course, found family and chosen family and, and friends and, and acquaintances also. It doesn't have to be these completely tight relationships. There's so many levels of it where, you know, there's business relationships that you have with people that might last for, for many years. And it's, it's still, it's a different level of support and care um, and, and curation that you have to have with that also. So it's, it's extremely important, especially as a writer, as, as someone who, and as an introvert, as someone who needs a lot of time alone, but I also do need those connections and, you know, those, those lifelines to other people for support and to give support and to give back as well as the things that I'm getting from them. I don't even, you guys, I mean, very thoughtful. I, I, I'm, I think that's probably the first and so I just started writing down on my, my pad, just so many important, critical words, I think, in that understanding of community. Um, I think you, um, Kamisha used the word allow and being intentional and, and don't apologize for saying 
that you're repeating the word intentional because I, I know for fresh development, I say that all the time because I think we have to be really clear about what we're doing intentionally and being deliberate. And I think a lot of times people aren't, but what we're saying is, especially when you want to make changes in your life, you have to be deliberate. You have to be intentional. You have to be extremely aware about what it is that you're doing and why. And then Leslie, you, you pull back the, 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 the very important point that we have different layers of community and that they meet the needs of different aspects of us. So in the book, what I do, I, I outline, I believe it's like work, school, and then kind of like your general community. And I simply ask people to reflect on their allies. And I think a lot of what, what you mentioned and, and Kamisha, what you talked about are your allies. We need to have them. And if you are in a situation that's toxic, then you need to remove yourself from that situation because, well, it's toxic, it's not helpful. And it could be a family situation. Um, and, and then like you said, Leslie, everyone doesn't have to be on that same level of closeness. We're in certain groups and they meet a certain, certain needs. And I think you guys did an amazing job with that, but thank you. But I think it's a lot to think about, but we all need community. Like you said, whether you're introvert or extrovert or ambivert, and we've been talking a lot about that. One, one of the gentlemen that I interviewed, he literally, he said all three, and I was so impressed by that because you know, it's part of the work that I do. And, but that's part of understanding your personality, those trends, with your, within yourself, within other people, when you deal with interpersonal relationships. So I did want to ask, this is not, this is not on my list, but I want to ask since we, we are all self-professed um, introverts here. Um, you guys have taken your Myers-Briggs? Okay, so I want to, I want to know your four letters. I tell you my, I'm INTJ and <laughs> INTJ. I okay. am INTJ, yes. I'm INFJ. Uh, oh, you're you're feeling. Oh, do you I'm have very, rare? very. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's like um, the most rare. Yeah. Um, one one of my colleagues. She she's an, she's an F two. I I bought her a, a shirt that said um, short but savage, and because she's like really petite like that. But that is that is her. She doesn't like confrontation, but she can read a situation. Mm. and um she's just really smart she's really astute but she does she has that little bit of a savage part if you if you get it wrong but um yeah, yeah. <laughs> i think it also falls into the i'm a scorpio too so oh no there you go <laughs> <laughs> Look, i have a husband who's a scorpio so i say i can say that so i don't know but he is not remotely close to being an introvert okay <laughs> Oh, wow. Okay, that wasn't part of it, but I love having those conversations. So I just wanted to chuck that in there. So anyone who is not taking it, go take the Myers-Briggs. Have everyone in your family. You'll have really nice conversations. And then you'll be like, hmm, that explains a lot. Right? Yes, you learn a lot. <laughs> it definitely does. Okay, I'm just going to ask you guys a couple of more questions. You ladies, a couple of more questions, and then we can draw it to a, to a close. Um. So when you reflect on your own self-care, what does that look like? And maybe what should it look like? Maybe some things that you know you need to do that you aren't doing. Mm. Yeah, no, that's important. Um, I think that so a lot of times self-care gets thought about as, oh, go have a massage, you know, like go lay on the beach or something. Uh, for me, I've taken it, I do get massages now because I, I you know, you get a little older, you start waking up and things don't move right. You're like, <laughs> like <laughs> what, what's going on? Right? <laughs> so I've incorporated that. But I mean, beyond that, I think it really is. It's, I mean, it's very personal. But for me, um, the Nat Ministry has helped a lot. There's a, an account on Instagram and other social media mm -hmm. called the Nat Ministry, which I highly, if you haven't seen it, go check it out. Because I used to feel so guilty about taking naps. I would get to about, and I've been self-employed for a long time. And I would wake up and be writing early in the morning, but I would get to about two or three o'clock in the afternoon and just feel exhausted. And I'm like, I'm just, I'm going to go take a nap. I'm not going to tell anybody. I'm just going to pretend I was working and I would feel guilty about it. And I think that account helped me like not feel so guilty about sometimes I just need to rest. 
And, you know, we're, we're told to push, 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 and you sleep when you're dead. And those things are really toxic. And uh, somehow they've gotten into our culture as, you know, just work all the time, work. And as an entrepreneur, as a self-employed person, you hear like, you won't be successful if you don't like work, you know, 90 hours a week. And, and so releasing myself from all of that, not that I ever really bought into it, but I felt guilty for not buying into it for a long time. Mm -hmm. And so saying, no, I, I need to rest. I need to take care of myself in whatever way that feels right. So I do try to, you know, let go of the guilt, be gentle with myself, with my own expectations. I feel like that is that self-care too. When I, you know, I'm very goal oriented and I like lists and schedules and, you know, things being the way they're supposed to be. And I bait myself up a lot of times when I don't meet that. Mm -hmm. And so just over the past, you know, maybe 10 years, really trying to be more gentle with myself, forgive myself when I can't meet my own expectations, you know, taking away other people's expectations. Mm -hmm. I think that's actually self-care too. Yeah. And, um, you know, aside from the, the other things that you need to, to feel good, like exercising and, and even just getting enough sleep, which I, I don't always do. You know, those, those are places where I kind of do fall down. I would love to try to get eight hours of sleep a night, like on top of the naps that I take. It doesn't happen, but still, you know, one thing I would, I would love to do to take care of myself. I've been better about exercising and I found activities that I really enjoy that get me active, which clears my mind. And I sort of scoffed at that, like, you know, I would exercise and feel so terrible because it's like, this is supposed to make me feel better, but I feel awful. Um, but, uh, you know, changing it to things I actually enjoy helps a lot. You don't have to do what other people are doing. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, just that personal thing that whatever makes you uh, feel, not just feel good, but relax and be kinder to yourself in whatever way that means for you. That's what I think about with self-care. Great, great. Thank you so much. And Kamisha? I am basically the same um, <laughs> as the oldest of 10. Um, mm -hmm. It's, I was raised with high expectations of myself. I was reading by the time I was three and I was supposed to skip a grade, but my mother was like, you're too little. And so, you know, it's, it's always been, I need to get an A. I need to get an A. And my mom, bless her heart, she was like, you know, these are okay too. <laughs> you know, they're, they're, it's fine. Like these are not bad. And I was like, no. <laughs> and so like at a very young age in high school, I was placed in AP classes and I was taking college courses. And so I'm like, I got to be the best, got to be the best. And so when I got my transcript back and I was number seven, I was devastated. I was like, I'm not even the top five. Like I've, I've always had those super high expectations of myself. And then I realized as I got older, who are you, who are you trying to impress? <laughs> is this for you or is this for everyone else? And so it really, it really opened my eyes to a lot. Like in classes, if I'm there is, I've never not turned in assignments. And then I realized, you know what? I'm not going to die if I don't turn in this assignment. I'm not going to stay up until 3 a.m. to get this paper done. If it's not done, it's just not done. You know, being able to tell myself that, you know what? You're not perfect. Mm -hmm. You don't have to do every single thing every single time to the utmost of your ability. You can bring 75% of, of yourself to this meeting. You can bring 75% of yourself to this class. You're sick. You can take off. That is an option. Yeah. Right. And so, so many of us have this thing where we put our jobs before ourselves. I did that my whole life up until I was self-employed. And I was like, Ooh, <laughs> I need to create boundaries. <laughs> um, so recently creating client boundaries has been life-changing, literally life-changing. Like I don't work between two and three 30. It's supposed to be my tea and balcony time just so I can sit outside, have some fresh air, recalibrate, get away from the screen for a little bit. And when I first started it, I started squeezing in clients. And then I was like, you know what? That's not what this is for. 
And so having that hour and a half break, it's like, it's like a jump start. Now, obviously, it's not as good as a nap, but it feels really, really good. And I will also um, agree with Leslie's point that naps are just, Mm -hmm. (laughs) there's a reason why kids take naps and just jump back up and just able to do everything. You can conquer the world with a nap. Yep. And so I've recently been doing naps again and I'm just like, oh, wait, yes. <laughs> I don't need <laughs> drinks or coffee. Like I'm ready to go. Like, <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, that's, that's what self-care, self-care to me looks like not just, like Leslie said, it's not just about massages or going on vacations. Although I will definitely recommend that if you're in a space where you have not taking any of your vacation days and you're not using any of your sick days you need to evaluate that Mm -hmm. because you you have it like there's no reason for you not to use it like you can die tomorrow and those that your legacy will be that you never took a sick day (laughs) like that's not (laughs) like what how does that that doesn't make sense so um take care of yourselves like seriously think about what brings you peace Mm -hmm. what makes you connected to contentness right contentment what what slows your your mind down what slows your body down what relaxes you sometimes you may want to watch some anime sometimes you may want to do some tai chi instead of going to a gym right find what works for you we have like this culture where everything moves so fast. Oh, the next trend is this to lose 12 pounds in two days. I don't know if that's a thing, but you know, (laughs) lose 12 pounds in two days, do this diet, go to the gym this many days a week. And it's just like, girl, I don't enjoy the gym. I do like Tai Chi. So let's do that. I do enjoy yoga. Let's try that. I tried um, something else. I was like, that's not for me. And so just, you know, being able to practice different things and understand you have to understand and learn yourself for the self part and then take care of it for the care part yeah i mean you guys said it right i mean it's self-care is very personal very your prescription is your prescription and that works best for you as an individual and for your your life your your lifestyle i will definitely co-sign with the naps i i think one of the the best bits of advice as a parent, when I was a a young new parent, the doctor said, you take a nap when you put your child down for a nap. Mm. And I did that. And I remember when I was a kid, my mom used to always take naps. But when, when I, when I had my son and then, and then my daughter, I'll put him, put him down for, um, for a nap. And then, and then at some point my son, he didn't want naps. I'm like, you know what? Mom needs a nap. And you just have to be quiet and we're going to be in the same space. Um, and my daughter talks about it. She, she, remember, she remembers it. But because if you don't, then you're looking at the, the quiet time as with, with, with your child or whatever it is, as time for you to clean, for you to, to you fill in all these other chores. So what that means is that you're constantly moving from one task to the next. Yeah. And then your kid is up or someone's home or you have to go someplace and you haven't um, taken a bit of time for yourself. And so a lot of what I heard from your discussion of self-care is taking that critically needed time for self and being deliberate or Kamisha being intentional um, with that and having that work-life balance, even if you're working from home. Yeah. Okay. So I have two questions and then we answer them um, quickly. And let me think, Hmm. I'm going to ask you this question. Complete the sentence and we start with Kamisha. Um, I love. I love peace. (laughs) Nice. Some people wake up and choose violence every day. I wake up and choose (laughs) peace because violence is so much energy. It's so much energy. It's just. It's it's just healthier, literally healthier spiritually, physically, like emotionally, socially to just 
choose, just choose peace. <laughs> I love peace. It's my favorite thing. <laughs> I love waking up and reading. I love calling my mom. Hey girl, you good? Great. I'll talk to you some other time. You know, just <laughs> peace, just peace. Oh, it's two o'clock nap time. You know, it's just <laughs> peace. Just not being in I was going to say something very savage, but minding my business. <laughs> I'm going to get you that shirt. <laughs> I'm get that shirt too. Send me your size. <laughs> minding my business brings me peace. Mm. And I love peace. I don't focus on what the, the other publishers are doing. I don't focus on what the trends are. I stay off of social media if I don't have to be on there because I like peace. And comparison is the thief of joy. And I like joy. I love joy. I love peace even more, but I love joy. And so minding my business, staying in my lane, staying focused, staying intentional about where I put my energy and who I let in my space. Again, peace. I love it. I love peace. It's the best thing. Thank you. (laughs) Now, that's amazing. I just want to say really quick that I I love that you love peace because I've been feeling guilty about being conflict averse recently. (laughs) And I don't like conflict. And, you know, my father-in-law and my husband, they weren't really arguing, but he was like, oh, you don't like conflict. I'm like, I don't like conflict. I'm not afraid of it. But I don't want to. Yes. So I I appreciate that you love peace. And and that really helped me out. So thank you for that. Um, (laughs) I love the first thing that came to mind was expressing myself. Like I love creativity and I, do, I feel like I have something to bring to the world and, and kind of, and letting that shine through is something that is just so much a part of everything that I do. And so, yeah, just expressing what's inside and kind of getting it out of me. Cause there's always something more brewing, like burning inside that has to come out. Mm-hmm. So that is, and it just brings me, it brings me a lot of joy to, to yeah. do that. And that's why I write and that's why I create. Um, and that's what I love. Oh, okay, thank you. Final question, ladies, and you can interpret however you choose. And we'll begin with you, Leslie. Um, what is the color of your resilience? Mm. That is really interesting. It's so abstract. I <laughs> I think of rainbow, and I just think right. of because it's every color. You know, I, I think it's like a multicolored type of thing, which might be a cheat, but um, it, because resilience is so much a part of every facet of your life, and it it. Um, you know, determines whether you're going to have a peaceful, joyful life or not, I think. And, you know, the, there's good parts about resilience and bad, but ultimately being able to stretch, when you need to stretch and, you know, contract, when you need to contract mm-hmm. feels like it, it, it impacts so much that it just feels, feels multicolored. It feels like multifaceted and just it's, it's part of every, every aspect of your being. I like that. Beautiful. Thank you. Kamisha? It's very, it, it gives me your peace, your, your, your resilience gives me Joseph in the multicolored, oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> multicolored coat of dreams. Um, I like that. I, I think that I would say that my resilience is purple. Again, I love peace. I love sleep. I love um, just relaxing, you know, and, and all that that entails in protecting myself. So my resilience is purple. Maybe not like a, maybe not like a lavender, maybe like, like a, like a royal purple, like a deep, deep purple. Rich purple. Depth, like a rich, <laughs> deep, like a textured purple, like something real. Yeah. <laughs> maybe got some glitter sprinkled on. I, I, it's got glitter. Know, just, <laughs> I've, I've heard purple twice and then the one lady she said purple and she also said I think with, with glitter um as well sparkles so listen you I like it. <laughs> you're the first person who, who said um who said rainbow <laughs> to my men first and they said it was black of course, <laughs> of course. <laughs> although I had, had a, oh, a lady who also said black guys that is our time Wow. Um, you guys have no idea how many of you do. This was an amazing conversation. Yes, yeah. It was wonderful listening to you. And I was right about the energy. I don't know. I don't know if you guys could feel it. but No, I, I feel like Kamisha and I have the same brain almost. <laughs> there you go. That's going to make writing your next novel a little bit difficult now, isn't it? Well, you, you guys are amazing. This was, this was great listening to you. 
learning from you. Anyway, I'm just, I'm really awed with you guys. And I really appreciate you fitting me into your schedule. And I'm sure everyone who will listen to this, this video will get nice um, nuggets from it. Some of them are going to be big and some of them are going to be small, but I, but your story I'm sure will resonate with a lot of people. So thank you for your time. Thank you for sharing your truth. And I wish you guys much success and many, many naps. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Thank you so much. We'll take a nap right now. <laughs> right now. Okay. I'm gonna-